Hello, everybody, on this December 23rd, two days before Christmas, and I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas who's out there. I hope you have a great Christmas. This is a wonderful time for us to celebrate love and charity and fraternity, and it is so exciting to be here talking to everybody on this December 23rd, 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern, all time zones in between and time zones around the world. I'm just so happy to, to be part of this. This is a wonderful, wonderful time to be on Earth because we are in the middle of a great transition. We are in the middle of transitioning from a planet of atonement to a planet of regeneration. And we owe that all to our spiritual guides. We owe that to Jesus Christ, our, what we consider like the governor of the planet, the leader of the planet, and other planets besides this. He's a very, very high spirit. Something that we may attain to who knows how many billions of years from now. But we are so lucky to be under his divine leadership that we I give, try to give thanks to Jesus Christ daily. And, of course, we're told all this, and he promised us information about how to behave in the world and what was going to happen to the earth when he said, I will send you a consoler to tell you more. And that consoler was Alan Kardec, who codified the Spirits book. And you can find, of course, I've said this before, but on PDF, you can find it on the EDICEI bookstore. You, If you like to, you can... Click on his picture on my blog, nwspiritism.com, and it will take you to EDICEI Bookstore, and you can find all of Alan Kardec's books yeah, in English, all the translated. Of course, I think all of them have been translated in English, but uh, Chico Xavier's book, uh, some of Devaldo Franco's, yeah, Beyond, uh, Yvonne Piera. You can find other books on spiritism. And uh, believe me, every book you read is just exciting. So... Tonight, we're talking about verse 14 in my, in my book, which is chapter 14, How to Live Inner Peace Through Spiritism. And I base this book on a very short poem, 24 Verses, by Andre Luis. And his verse 14 shows you how short they were. It's happiness in your commitments. And what better message could we have here on this Christmas time is happiness in your commitments. So let's talk about that. So happiness in your commitments is natural in heaven. In all of the spiritual literature I have written so far, I'm sorry, read so far, I have seen that when people work and they have their functions, they love their function. Oh, Ayani, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. right. Lula da Silva Bazara. I think you're new to here. And Barry, hello, Barry, and Merry Christmas to you and to everybody on. Thank you so much. So what I, what I have read is that the, the functions and the jobs these people have, these spirits, these higher spirits, they just so they're interested in it. They are vital and it gives them such wonderful feedback of helping others. They, they really feel the happiness in that when they can do something, they see, they see, you know, maybe not immediate gratification, but they see that they are actually helping other spirits grow and mature. And that is something that we need to, we need to do here on earth too. Well, Merry Christmas to you too. Uh, Ianni, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I apologize. So in the higher spheres where we return after a life of struggles, victorious in our quest to improve and do more good than the mistakes we regret, being happy is the normal state. You are surrounded by positive people when you're in the higher spheres. Now, I'm not talking about the lower zone or the dark abyss, right? I've had other information on my YouTube channel. And again, if you go to my website, nwspiritism.com, you can go onto my YouTube channel or my BitChute channel. I'd recommend BitChute. It's, uh, you know, very good. A lot more, more and more people are going on BitChute since they do not censor everyone. I've seen YouTube start censoring even spiritual sites. At least that's what I've heard. I could be wrong. So, yes, go there. Uh, each one of these talks I do is on 
Kardak, or I should say this is on Kardak Radio Facebook Live. We, we do this Facebook Live every Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern, all the other time zones around the world. And then I put I post this to YouTube, but I also other do YouTube channels, uh, YouTube videos, five to eight minutes shorter, sometimes a little bit longer, on different aspects of spiritism. So please uh, share this share this video. Go to my YouTube site or BitChute site. Tell other people about the site and share those videos if you can. So spread the spiritist doctrine if that's if that's what motivates you, because it certainly is what motivates me. So I, as I was saying, these people, these spirits, they just they you know, and when they write to people like G. Val Owen, who uh, just you know, who is a wonderful medium, uh, uh, English. Um, Anglican vicar, uh, it was just you know they're just doing such great things to help to help you know these spirits rise above you know the the the, the lower zone and the dark abyss and it's just wonderful here and you can tell that you know they're always doing something exciting and isn't that what really we want to do with life because you know what we learn you know growing up you learn you know heaven is kind of a fuzzy thing and. And, you know, okay, I'm going to be there forever, eternity, but, you know, in the clouds. Of course, that would be so boring, right? They even say that in the spirits book when, the, uh, in, when they say, well, what is heaven? And they say, well, it's not like you think it is because, you, you know, it's not like the Elysian fields where you do nothing for eternity. You know, that would be hell. No, it's something that you're always learning. You're moving up. You're always going to the next step. There's multiple levels around the Earth. There's multiple levels around the solar system, around the galaxy, around this one universe, because there's multiple universes and different dimensions within the spirit world. We live in such a complicated world that you cannot... You're The greatest fantasy book, I've never read anything that's close to what the spirits tell us that heaven is about, right? Because in heaven, thought is action. And, of course, that's why we're being trained. And part of that training, as Henri Luis wrote in his poem, he wrote 24 verses. And in each one, he wrote okay, what you have to do in order to be trained. And what we're talking about is verse 14, which is chapter 14 in my book, happiness in your commitments. And so when I was talking about these higher spirits, is that when you go into a level of heaven, you are surrounded by positive people. There are no worries about money or your job. While it may be challenging, it isn't in danger of disappearing. Sickness only exists on the physical plane, and your age and appearance is whatever you want it to be. But <coughs> sorry, to prepare ourselves for life in heaven, we should cultivate <coughs> excuse me. We should cultivate how to welcome and prosper in a relationship and careers while on earth. With this knowledge, there's a, that almost nothing happens to us by chance when we're <coughs> physically on this planet. We need to sit through our classes, attentive and serene. When I say classes, I mean, uh, really, what we are here on earth, we have a succession of trials. And they're almost like when we were in high school, right? You go to a class, 50 minutes, the bell rings, you go to the next one here. And as an adult, we have one trial, maybe parallel, successive trials, or in simultaneous trials, I should say. And you just have to get used to that. Things will go on. And then the next thing, no trial lasts forever. The spirit world tells us there's no trial without an exit. There's no trial that there's not some way that you can be victorious in it. Now, to us, in our in our perspective, even being victorious isn't good enough because it's not what we wanted. But that trial was meant to teach us something. We are on earth to go through these things because it's there to mold our character and our personality. It's there to make us able to ascend in the spirit world, to become a productive member of society. And a productive member of society in the spirit world is one who has discipline in their mind. They can control their thoughts and they can actually help other spirits. And the more you control your thoughts, the more power and the more attributes you have as a spirit. So the spirits book answers to the, a question put to the spirits by the codifier of spiritism, Alan Kardec. So in question 921, this is what the question is. We can conceive that man will be happy upon the earth when the human race shall have been transformed 
But meanwhile, is it possible for each man to ensure for himself a moderate amount of happiness? And remember, we started this, verse 14. Be happy in your commitments. And this is the answer of the Spirit, said to Alan, Alan Kardec, the Code of Fire Spiritism. Man is more often the artisan of his own unhappiness. If he obeyed the law of God, he would not only spare himself much sorrow, but would also procure for himself all the felicity that is compatible with the grossness of early earthly existence. Now, what are they telling us? We have to take that answer. We have to put that in the knowledge of the law of karma. Every action has a reaction. That should always be foremost in our minds. And when they say we are the artisan of our own unhappiness, that happens probably 99.9% .9 of the time because we do an act that we know that we filtered it through our conscience. And we kind of know, I don't think that's right, but I'm going to rationalize the way that it's right because it benefits me or whatever I want a lot. And I can rationalize that, that it's okay. Well, no, you can't. And that's, and somehow all those little things we do that we know are wrong come back to us. And they'll come back to us either in this life or the next life in trials that we need to learn. And of course, the trials we're going through now are things that happened in previous lives. So therefore, almost everything we experience that is a hardship or a result is a result of a deed that we need to repair and to learn from. Therefore, when these things happen, be thankful for the opportunity in whatever you encounter in life. After all, don't we feel exuberant when we wrong when we wrongly insulted or, or hurt a friend and then found a way to make them feel better? Didn't that feel didn't that feel so good? Wasn't that a huge relief? Use this same emotion of knowing that you've done something wrong and now you're really making people feel better, even though you may not see it. Use that in your entire life because that's really what we're here. And the spirit, Joanna D'Angelis, adds to this. This is what she says. And she is so brilliant. It's amazing. And you mostly find her in the books by Devaldo Franco. This is what she says. You are a rough stone in need of polishing. Even though you may be rough on the outside, you have the brightness of the stars in the inside. And it is up to you to release it. Start this new process in your life right now. Give yourself the chance to prove to yourself how much you have and you will succeed. Experience the pleasure of rebuilding your future and you will start being happy right away. Very true words. And believe it, every day you are, you are building towards your next life and your next and your next. But if, as you can, if you can start ascending and start listening to your conscience and putting everything against that law library that, that is given to us upon birth, right? We, everyone has this. You can start being happy. And what she's telling is this happiness is a state of mind. It is an attitude that you can cultivate. It can sustain, sustain you through the bad times in any commitment. And there will be rough patches. It's guaranteed because... We know there's rough patches. We are on a planet of atonement. What does that planet of atonement mean? We are we are at the maturity level of spirits that need to learn. We need to remove the blemishes from our personality, hate, greed, envy, gossiping too much, all the things I've done, right? And replace them with the better emotions, love and charity and fraternity, so on, right? Live by the golden rule. Much easier to say than to do. For, especially for us in this culture on this time on the earth. So, and, you know, the rough patches, sometimes for the good of all parties, you may have to leave a marriage, a relationship, or, or a job, right? Nevertheless, you will soon take on new commitments. Learn from the past and seize the occasion to demonstrate your inner light. So to be happy in your commitments, we really have to learn to seize the opportunity that is given to us. And it's never too late to start with a new attitude and you'll feel better. You know, to change your life, change, you have to change your mind first. And the spirit Neo Lucio tells us how Jesus related the story of a Pharisee who led an exemplary life. He spent days praying in the temple. He fasted and he studied the texts of the Old Testament. 
And when there was a dangerous plague in the city near Jerusalem, high, high angel sought him out to help him, to help tend to the sick, to alleviate their suffering. But the wise and learned Pharisee didn't want to make contact with the sick and common people. The angel spoke to other wise and devout folks, but the, he got the same answers. No one wanted to put themselves at risk. In light of these excuses not to help, the messenger from above, above found an old criminal who wanted to change his ways. Through invisible threads of thought, the angel invited him to follow him. The old thief really did want to change, so he didn't hesitate a second. He hearkened to the angel's gentle coercion and qu quickly devoted himself enthusiastically and genuinely, offering his robust and authentic cooperation to the ministry of aid and salvation. He buried bodies, concocted medicines that were fitting for the situation, sowed encouragement, relieved the afflicted, renewed the spirits of the sick, freed countless little children who were threatened by the harm, created services of consolation and hope, and in doing so won solid friendships in heaven, thereby advancing remarkably in the path toward paradise. So you never know. A new beginning could always be just moments away. A mental note to dive into a new commitment without hesitation, with dedication and earnestness, will bring its own reward. We, After all, we tell our children, when we see them laying around and bored and complaining, go out, go out and do something. We know that constructive action wipes away useless thoughts and regrets and refocuses focuses our energy. The Spirit Emmanuel wrote about negative aspects of workers who always complain and blame any and all problems on objects or people other than themselves. We all know that, right? First, we've all done that ourselves, but we try not to. Most of us kind of learn not to do that. This is what uh, Emmanuel said. Good workers, on the other hand, understand before anything else the profound meaning of the opportunity they have received. They not only make use of all their resources, but they also respect other peoples. They do not depend on the seasons. They plant the fruits of the cold and the heat with the same enthusiasm. They are friends of nature. They learn its lessons. They are upbeat, and they find the same contentment in both the hard work of sowing and in the joy of harvesting. What is he telling us? He's telling us that good spirits are sending us the message of embracing our work and to seek fulfillment from what in our endeavors may teach us. We are put in that job, in this environment, in this body, at this time, because it's going to supply us with something that's going to help us, that's going to teach us something. And if we can muster the fortitude to strive to be the best as we can possibly at our jobs at this moment, even though we may not like it particularly, then we are learning the need for perfection in all things. And that is, you know, much easier said than done because I've been in that situation and I still complain. I try not to I try to catch myself, but if we, if we can get better and better at it every day, God bless you. So why are we, why am I talking about this? Because spiritism tells us our goal is to one day become a perfected spirit. This means we make the correct decisions. We know the right answers, and we contemplate the, the long-term ramifications of our actions. We hone these skills while on earth. On earth, during our apprenticeship as an immature spirit, we can make mistakes and do little or no harm. We're like a child in a kindergarten class. We can break crayons or eat the glue, and nothing's going to happen to us. We can begin to comprehend how to analyze situations correctly. We can build upon our thousands of years of experience that is within us in our conscience and instincts. New determinations of what is right and wrong in a myriad of conditions. If a person resists or detests the work they are in, then careful construction and thoughtful planning are usually discarded. The only lesson learned at the end of a hard day is that time moves slowly. Right, because if you're completely bored, everyone's been through this. Oh, I can't wait till the clock's done. Or you're in classroom, you know, all of us have done this as a as a kid, and just you know, just tune out the teacher and just kind of look at the clock, tick, 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 tick. What what does that do? It it does nothing for us. It does absolutely nothing. So the spirit of manual knows notifies us of the effectiveness of the combination of work done competently and selfless service for our spiritual growth. This is what he says. An honestly practiced profession, even when remunerated, 
and you get you get paid for it, induces people to respect the fulfillment of their duties. But selfless giving, which is one sacrifice for the happiness of others, ennobles the spirit. This is why everyone feels the need to build a permanent altar in their hearts to true heroes. Selfless giving begins where duty ends. When practiced, it produces a reaction in the higher spheres that reaches down to humanity. An ordinary delinquent in prison inspires pity because of his suffering. But the pioneer of a noble calls, unjustly jailed in the same prison, elicits admiration, respect, and emulation. The friendly and conscientious administrator who scrupulously divides his earnings and spends his share honestly is an example of earthly virtue. But the person who works selflessly for the benefit of others is a messenger of heavenly virtues. A governess who receives a salary for her tender care of a child merits high regard and recognition. But a motherly heart with its constant acts of self-sacrifice is a fascinating and splendid example that emphasizes the glory of pure love. Thus, as Manuel says, mathematicians who are acclaimed by the people and are adequately paid for their work are classified as scientists. But the scientists who are only committed to the project for the peace and security of civilization and who employ all their energy and complete oblivion of themselves to reach their goals are regarded as benefactors. Humankind progress forward when faithful to their obligations. Through selfless giving, angels are drawn to them, thereby improving life in the world. So what is Emmanuel telling us? He's telling us that we should be working for a goal higher than ourselves, for a tangible good for other humans while being paid or not. It's all beneficial to mankind and to ourselves. And I know what he means because I've worked at jobs where I have felt I've been paid, I've been paid well, but I've really enjoyed because I know it's beneficial to many people. I've worked at a medical equipment, a couple of medical equipment companies, and all of us felt good that we were making this medical equipment to actually help people who are ill, help them become better, help test them, help diagnose, et cetera. Those are wonderful. Those, you know, those type of, of jobs are just wonderful things to be in. And people who are teachers, nurses, people who are helping other people through different ways. Uh, God bless them all. You, you know, everyone will go through good periods and bad periods. Sometimes you'll have a horrible boss or a good boss. You just try to stay, as we said on this verse, happiness in your commitments. Say happiness and commitments and the rest of the hierarchy above you and the foolishness of a lot of the people in whatever company you're in, because we've all seen that. Try to tune that out if you can or just laugh at it. So the next thing that's very happy to, in our commitments, and we should be happy in our commitments, is family commitments, right? Messages from spirits via spiritist mediums have always highlighted the role of the family in society and its importance in our quest for improvement. In the spirits book, the role of the family is revealed. Question 774. Some persons have inferred from the abandonment of the young of animals by their parents that the ties of the family among mankind are merely a result of social customs and not a law of nature. What is to be thought of this inference? So this is what the spirits uh, told the different mediums uh, that responded to this question. Now remember how Alan Kardec codified the spirits book, and you can find it on the EDICI uh, bookstore page, right? If you click Alan Kardec's picture, uh, and there's his, oh, all this way, there's his picture up on that side. And you can also uh, find it on amazon.com or on PDF. So they asked, what about the family? So this is what the spirits responded to uh, various mediums. And Alan Kardec, as he codified the books, he only took the answers from multiple mediums that had similar answers to the same question. This is the answer. Man has another destiny than that of the animals. Why then should you always be trying to assimilate him to them? There is in man something more than physical wants. There is the necessity of progressing. Unlike the animals, I, that's, that's what I'm saying. Now I'll go back to the quote. So, social ties are necessary to progress, and social ties are drawn closer by family ties. For this reason, family ties are a law of nature. God had willed that man should learn through them to love one another as brothers. 
And then the, the next question was, 775, what would be the effect upon society of the relaxation of family ties? And the answer was sh a short four words, a relapse into selfishness. So think about that. What they said, social ties are necessary to progress. Commitments to family are all the more important now in our current culture, right? Society has been trying its best since the middle of the 20s 20th century to break the ties of the family. It's very, very sad to see. Governments have stepped in to replace spouses. Media constantly designate the role of a husband and wife. And the latest social media applications promise instant satisfaction without any ties. Without the fa family, humans become mere consumers. They are free to indulge in whatever makes them feel good at the time. Now, I'm not saying we should return to the days when single mothers were ostracized, our homosexual sexuality was punished by law, our marriage was for life, no matter how terrible it was in the home. Only to point out that our society should promote responsibility instead of celebrating irresponsibility. We should at least have to think twice, three or four times about abandoning family. And there should be more Emphasis on people helping to stay together and helping the kids because the family is so important. The Spirit Joanna, writing in 1997 in her book, Adolescence and Life, stated this. It is urgent for parents and educators to commit to a reevaluation of the moral conduct intended for the new generation in order to avoid the collapse of culture and civilization, which today are in their darkest period in history ever. I'm going to read that again. This is her writing in 1997. It is urgent for parents and educators to commit to a reevaluation of the moral conduct intended for the new generation in order to avoid the collapse of culture and civilization, which today are in their darkest period in history. It's only gotten worse. This is 2018. This is December 23rd, 2018. 21 years after and it has gotten even worse. We live in this culture of relative morality where anything is going. And if you and if you point out something's not right, right, you should commit more to the family, you are called horrible names. Anything you do now, you're called a racist or a Nazi or whatever. It, 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 it makes it so we lose all meaning of words. So each one of us needs to re in our reinstill in ourselves that commitment. Now, hey, I have been guilty too, right? But we all need to start changing now. And the spirit Joanna, who was in a previous life, Joanna de Cusa, who was mentioned in the New Testament, she also lived at the time of St. Francis of Assisi and was incarnated as, as Sister Juan Inez de la Cruz, Born in 1651, died in 1695, one of the great poets of her time. The fact that she wrote, this was the darkest period in our history, fully illustrates that the arc of society is approaching the heights of materialism. And that's been told to um, Reverend G. Va Owen by uh, High Spirits, is that we are on this, this path to materialism and that we are almost either we've at the apogee or we're Pat, a little bit past it where we, you know, and, and of course this has been on purpose by the spirit where they knew this would happen. Now think, you know, think of our culture and the, and the line we're going and we think, Oh, how screwed up we are and all this type of stuff. But the spirit world, they've, they've, you know, billions of planets where people like us, immature spirits like us, will go through these learning curves. And so they, they, um, you know, they knew that we had to build up our technology and as we build up technology, we become more materialistic. But now something has to start happening where we get we balance technology, spirituality, and materialism. So there and there needs to be a balance. There needs to be a recognition of our purpose on earth and our requirement for spiritual and character improvement. The pendulum of the freedom of choice for whatever lifestyle one desires, no matter what the consequence are for innocent bystanders, such as blameless children, has gone too far. It should return to the center, where, of course, exceptions occur and those people are helped, where loving relationships between any combinations of genders are encouraged and supported. 
It all comes down to staying involved if possible with the lives of loved ones and family. And this is the vital point. The family we are born into and the family we create are all part of our customized plans for our edification. And I have not done, you know, even, and I'm guilty of that too, right? I, but I am trying my hardest. So I'm not saying that I'm innocent. Jose Her Herculano Pierre's explains the ties between spirits and physical families. This is what he says. Every spirit that reincarnates brings its personality intact within itself, already formed in previous reincarnations. The similarities of psychological mor moral characteristics among parents, children, and other descendants not come from the physical body, but rather from their spirits. The uniqueness of each human being is represented by what each one actually is on its own. Therefore, there is a Cartesian parallelism between heredity and affinity. Once we admit to this conclusion, which today has been carefully considered by great scientific research centers, it is easy for us to understand the need for both social and emotional independence for these children who have emancipated themselves, and especially for the ones who have built their own family. Spiritual affinities do not imply dependence and submission because each spirit is directly responsible for its own evolution. Parents are responsible for their children regarding guidance offered through examples and education. What is he telling us? He's told us a lot. It means that the likeness and personality, aptitude and talents of a son and daughter to one or both of their parents isn't just a factor of genetics and upbringing. It is deeper. It extends into the spirit realm. Think about that. Your children, you knew your children from previous lives and life in the spirit realm. Most probably, not always, there are exceptions to this. So this is where the law of affinity brought this group together, your family group. The law of affinity brought your family group. You knew, you were aware of each other. You were part of the same, you know, somewhere on the same level of heaven. You're on this this level, and you knew each other, and you most of you planned to be together as a family. The law, that's the law of affinity. There may have been a family unit in previous life and chosen once again to support each other during your schooling on earth. Imagine the feeling of leaving your family because of your search for pleasure or momentary desire, which you could not combat, and then finding out when you return to the spirit world that your real family, those you have cherished for centuries, are the very ones you deserted. It's happened, right? These poor souls are full of regrets when they discover their mistake. In one instant, a man went to earth on a mission. And I forgot what book this was, but he, his six best friends, it was one of the Andre Louis series of books, who had been companions for thousands of years were to be part of his family on earth. He was born into a family where his mother died, then his father remarried. His father and stepmother had six more children. Later, his father died. He was left as the main supporter of the family. He, In his physical life, he hated being dragged down by his stepmother and the children. So he left, never looking back, happy to be free of the responsibilities, leaving the poor family destitute. When he died, he found out that he and his six friends were to be part of a mission to help others on earth. He was to be a linchpin of the entire plan. Instead, through his rejection of his moral commitments, he betrayed him, his friends and himself. His spiritual pain was immense. He wanted to return to earth to try once again to repair the damage he caused. He will be allowed to since there's always an opportunity for redemption. So think about this. So in our happiness for commitments is really rooted in the fulfillment in the family. And the spirit Joanna sets the reason to be happy in your commitments to your family. This is what she says about fulfillment in the family. The special treasure that the family constellation reaches fulfillment after the long existential journey, when from the first encounter, the two spirits that decide to build the bloodline group come together through the strong ties of love. Legalizing its union through marriage, the moral responsibility is structured on the aspect and dedication that exists among the partners of this significant undertaking. Aware of the serious commitment to which they give themselves to, little by little, they discover the greatness of the art and science of love, facing all the difficulty and challenges ahead of them, setting objectives that are always multiplied and open to broader prospects. 
The adventure of the union provides them with the intellect and moral development that serve as a compass for future fruition to which they aspire. From the moment when the physical union provides a possibility for the advent of the offspring, the couple's personal aspirations shift and would be geared towards other spirits that we temporarily entrusted to them in the condition of divine loans that they'll have to account for after concluding the ministry of care of their own evolving needs. During this existential course, going through the inevitable clashes of the process of education and rehabilitation, rehabilitation the feelings of affection and duty, and duty consolidate upon working in the consciousness that extends the capacity of discernment in relation to life and the complement compromises that resulting from the spiritual knowledge that commands for the route chosen. All of the commitment applied often turn into personal sacrifice and renunciation expresses itself in grand and eloquent silences and sufferings, well taken so that the offspring may be developed without the marks of the conflicting emotional instability of the parents or the less fortunate circumstances of the social group, particularly in the family structure. In the long history, of coexistence between dependent little children and the adults, be they of a past or present nature in relation to the domestic group, the psychological maturity develops in a relationship that should turn into motivation for the future as a way of mending the disruptive past with the aim of attaining balance and spiritual enlightenment of all those who are part of the domestic structure. Let me stop this for a second. So this shows it, it is just the linchpin of, of molding our character. Why are we on earth? We are on earth to remove our blemishes. As I said before, we are on earth to mold our character for the better. And the family, that's, that's where the mold starts. I'll go on what she says. In this organization in which spirits come together, sometimes repeating experiences previously thwarted, where sick feelings and inferior emotions are revived in a kaleidoscope of tests and atonements, we've all been there, the opportunities for moral renewal and mental elevation are manifested so that the results of full love may be harvested. In charge of events that are presented within a well-established program or that appear suddenly, the two parents responsible for the family consolation are the harvesters of the past achievements, and at the same time, the sowers of the future in constant movement of self-enlightenment. So that was a long quote by Joanna D'Angelis. But what she was trying to convey is that the rich and complicated tapestry of life we lead. The spirit world plans out each individual life, but this isn't done in a vacuum. Each life plan must coincide and intersect and complement all the other plans with each individual. Hence, our lives are a series and episodes a series of tests for each for others than ourselves. They may be our spouse, our children, our extended family, and strangers. These strangers to us may not be strangers in the spirit world. The lives in which we touch and move the most are our family, of course. Therefore, within the family group, the project plan of trials and tribulations are the most closely correlated, right? And especially in youth, that's when they're really trying, because you're the most malleable, right? Till you're about 15 to 18, 19, is that's why we go through childhood, so we can be molded to be better than we were in our last life. In order for the plans germinated in the spirit realm to come to fruition, each of us must play their part and follow through in our commitments. By running away, right? When suicide is the worst of that, never commit suicide because you are sent to this planet to finish the lessons you were assigned. Oh, how are Mariela and Medina? Hello. Good night to you, too. We, that's why we should never leave prematurely. We are here to learn. You're, you know, when you tell your child, oh, I want to get out of school. No, nope, you're, you're going to finish till you graduate. Same thing when we go from the spirit world as, as spirits into earth, into our physical bodies. We have to go and not leave till we are ready, until we finish our classes. And at the same time, we have to take care of ourselves, right? Because there's also, as Henri Louise was, as he told you in the book No Solar, which I recommend the movie too, uh, Astral City. He was an unconscious suicide. How is he an unconscious suicide? Well, he drank too much. He had syphilis, which was incurable during those days. 
And that's why he died an earlier death than he should have. Same thing with people using drugs and alcohol, all sorts of things that one should not do that will break down your body and it will make you leave your set of trials prematurely. So we're not supposed to do that. So we need to work. So in order for our plans germinated in the spirit realm to come to fruition, each of us must play their part and follow through in our commitments, happiness in our commitments. By running away, we not only harm ourselves, but the detailed plans of those around us. Let me, let me explain this, because we affect all sorts of people. There was a near-death experience of a young man who was severely injured. He was, and that was, that was really an accident. He was told he could come back to life, but he would be in pain for many years if he wanted to stay. The spirit showed him the changes which would occur if he chose to leave the earth before his life plan was finished. Now he's very injured, so he's given a choice. You can, you can, you know, we'll, we'll cure you as much as possible. You'll be in pain later on, but if you, so that's a sacrifice on your part. But if you do, if you do, and but if you decide not to come back because you don't want the pain, this is what will happen. He was shown this. Now, think of the spirit world of how they, you know, they're showing him this, this in live movie of what will happen if he doesn't come back. Think of the of the of the com computational power of how they can create these scenes of a possible future immediately to show this guy why he was in his near-death experience, this NDE. Just think about that, how complicated the spirit world is. When people have NDEs and they see all these things and say, okay, how, how, no. If we want to make a movie, it'd take a year, right? If a lot of people work out here, these they pull all this data together immediately. So this is what he was shown. If he died, his mother and father would divorce because of the pain of his death. His sister, instead of having a good career in life in front of her, would sink into drug abuse. Both of his parents, alone and bitter, would lead empty lives until their death. On the other hand, if he lived, his family would be proud of him, for he'd be the first of his extended relations to graduate from college, and his parents and sister would make great strides in their quest for spiritual growth. So his life intersected his family, and his absence would have devastating results. Who knows how many other personal paths of enlightenment would be altered? Therefore, following our commitments and being joyful and happy in those commitments is one of the most poignant and beautiful labors of love we can perform. So, again, I hope this helps of our why Henri Louise wrote that in his 14th verse and is in his poem, Inner Peace, Happiness in Your Commitments. It is one of the linchpins of ascending spiritually. And of course, I go through each one of these in my book, How to Live, Inner Peace Through Spiritism. And I would recommend everyone to read about Alan Kardec, the Spirits book, read whatever you can find on uh, Chico Xavier. He's written uh, almost, actually now over 500 books in Portuguese, but there's a lot of them, especially on the EDICI bookstore. That, of course, I said before, go on my blog, NW Spiritism. Oh, what do they say? Okay, here's a question from Doris. What do they say about people getting cancer? Yes, that is a trial. And in fact, when we think about that, let me give you an example, uh, not cancer, but for an ulcer. When on release was in a uh, reincarnation pavilion, he was showing a picture of a body. And he saw in, in uh, kind of one of the intestines or down by the stomach, this kind of black mark. He said, like, what is that black mark? And he said, well, that is um, an ulcer this guy will have when he's in his mid-40s. It will be very painful for him. He goes, why does he have this ulcer? He goes, well, he stabbed the person in that particular point in the body. And now he's, he's going, you know, he asked for this trial and he wants to, you know, this way he'll find out how painful it was to be stabbed in that in that manner. Now, in other ones I've read about, and that's when I remember uh, the most here, but uh, is cancer is a trial. Now, sometimes the trial is actually dying a slower death, but as we're reminded all the time, and in fact, this, the spirit Joanna DeAngelis tells us, when people are on their deathbed, you know, don't don't think you want to 
end their pain prematurely. Those last moments are some of the most remarkable moments that person can live, and it will change their attitude and their perception and help them spiritually as they move over. Because remember, when we have some sort of death or when, when one of your family or someone you love dies, it's not a reason to be sad. They are in a mortal spirit and they're going on to the next plane. Now, cancer is an imbalance and you know, is, is most usually caused by either um, it was planned, it was a trial we needed to go through, the trial that we needed to either bring a family closer together or do something else. There's all, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. And I have it in my book, The Problem is the Solution. And it tells you why you go through sicknesses and, and different diseases or mental illnesses. It's always something that happened in the past. But also sometimes people will die prematurely because there's too much stress because they they uh, they created disharmony in their body. This is really like one of the most important things in my book, How to Live Inner Peace Through Spiritism, is you keep yourself healthy by following your conscience and, and trying to uh, uh, ascend spiritually. And there's been studies now. People who are spiritual have better health and they live longer. So cancer can either be self-imposed because of the stresses that people go through, either, you know, or it can be something from a previous life that's a trial that a person had to go through. So yes, cancer is usually a trial for a purpose. And the spirit world knows exactly if a person has a cancer, if it will be able to be cured or not. So all, the, all, everything is known, right? The future is known by the spirit world. And they'll know what sicknesses you have that has a cure or that you will expire from. And what will happen during your, your uh, being helped by doctors or hospitals. I hope that answers your question. If I didn't answer very well, it, it, there's so many different, I, I get these questions a lot, like, you know, why, you know, why do I have, uh, you know, this limitation, right? You know, there's people that talk to me have had some sort of, you know, mental limitation or physical limitation. And usually it's because uh, the spirit world is saying, okay, no, we're, we're giving you this limitation because you, you were either you're, you were powerful in your last life and you just went off and you, you know, you weren't nice to people, which I've been told in my past life, I took advantage of people. I've said many times on my programs and you're given this limitation to, you know, teach you a little bit of humbleness and not let you take off and be too successful, right? Some people, you know, some people are great orators, right? But who use that oratory for bad things now, you know, may, you know, be extremely shy and not be able to speak very well or a very high pitched voice or something. Uh, they will not let them do that same thing again because they want them to concentrate on other areas of growth areas. So that's why whenever you see someone being a real bad sickness or whatever, think of it most likely as a trial. And that, uh, you know, and you know that just like people with NDEs, when they come back from a near death experience, they understand life. They understand life is, is just this temporary thing. And people in cancer, they become, in one, at least the ones I've met, other people can have other ideas, of course, but they become more, usually they become much more spiritual. And that's because the spirit world is, is wanting them to do this. They need to become spiritual. And maybe they become spiritual just at the end, which, which is good enough for them, right? That, that can help them. And it's they have to understand that the material ties that hold us to this planet are nothing. And in fact, that's the, the great tragedy. And that's, uh, when I was talking at the first part of this talk about the work and happiness and their commitments of spirits helping these uh, higher spirits, helping these spirits set in the lower zone and the dark abyss. A lot of people, a lot of spirits in the lower zone, that means from the, from, um, the, the uh, surface of the earth to the first level of heaven are here. Why? Because of material commitments. They can't let go, right? They either want gold. I mean, Andre Luis met his grandfather down there looking for gold because he, he you know, he's just so materially tied. And it, it helps them. Sometimes these sicknesses help people break through of this dedication to acquire more and more and more. Because what, what does that do? What do we have when we leave the earth? Nothing except 
here, our brain. And that's the important thing to remember. And this is like the fear of many people. When you die, you just become nothing. Or you become part of this whole and you, you lose your identity. No, you are who you are. If you were a good person when you die, you still have your memories and your personality. Because that's why you're on earth, is to change your personality, make you an, a better person. You're still the same person. If you were a pickpocket when you die, when you're when you go and you go into the spirit world, you're down at the lower level, most probably, because you're the same person. You you know you're not nice to people. You take advantage of people, and the law of affinity puts you right where you need to be. Because how does how does the spirit world fight evil with evil? Okay, you're gonna be with your other. Okay, you want to be a pickpocket? Be with other pickpockets. Be with other thieves. That's how it works. So. And for those people who have who have that that you know, die of an illness, and a lot of times they will at their end they will understand that they'll understand, and that's a great gift for them. I know it's painful for on earth, and it's easy for me to say, and it's harder for families to live for. So God bless if you know someone like that. Okay, is there? Uh, so anyway, I am. I'll close up. I want to say Merry Christmas. Uh, I, you know, and just be thankful that we are under the leadership of Jesus Christ and all of his, his assistance and his legion and army of spirits that are helping us and watching over us. You cannot conceive of how much work the spirit world puts into us, you know, these immature spirits who, you know, are running around kind of doing stupid things. But uh, if they put so much effort on us learning and becoming better people and spirits so we can rise up into heaven and that's why i can say again uh, well i know and thank you and merry christmas is try and start not just watching what you say but watch what you think start learning to control your emotions and become you know nice in all circumstances okay well thank you well i'm glad doris that you found my explanation very helpful and uh, god bless all of you and i want to say good night and thank you for being my program. I'll be on next uh, Sunday too. So tell your friends, share this video to other Facebook groups if you can. Uh, go to my YouTube channel, etc. Tell your friends about it. And we'll post everything here again. God bless. Have a Merry Christmas, uh, everyone.